audio because I'm I'm actually in a hotel room and I am I just woke up because I had a rather late show last night and um, I'm not uh, ready to be filmed. <laughs> okay, because I was gonna say like I saw a picture you posted of um, you with a bunch of your books and you looked great. I was like, wow, you whatever you're doing, the secret you got to give it to me because like that's what I want to look like when I, I don't know how old you are. You're older than me, but you look like great. I mean, you look in good shape. You got a full head of hair. And you look happy and healthy. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm 56. I have been fortunate in that I still have most of my hair, but it's completely gray now, and that's fine. But um, uh, yeah, when I saw the the meeting, it just said aud- it literally said audio only. So I I don't have a place to really do a good visual. So no, that's fine. Yeah, no, I. That's I had this conversation the other day with somebody who's just about, you know, and you see a lot of, especially in the music and entertainment business, it's like some people are so resistant to getting older. They dye their hair and uh, the plastic surgery and the Botox and it's just all these things. And it's like, I feel like if you don't notice it, you know, it's almost like, okay, well, it's fine. But sometimes it's so noticeable. It's like, I think you look better if you just let your hair be gray and have a couple wrinkles or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I... I, well, to be honest, I started going gray when I was in high school. So I've oh. just kind of always been going gray. And I probably, I mean, my hair is pretty much totally white now. Uh, but it, you know, it's it's still it's still on top of my head. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm thankful. Yeah. Do you have a workout routine too? Because I mean you look like you're in shape. Well, I've I've sort of my whole life had some kind of workout routine, but it it varies depending on where I'm at in the world and what I have access to. But sometimes, sometimes I go to the gym. There's been periods of time when, you know, I hit the weights pretty hard and I've always been a swimmer. (laughs) Excuse me. Growing up in the Pacific Northwest, um, you know, we swam in lakes and in Puget Sound and, you know, saltwater swimming and, and lake swimming. And then, uh, also, you know, Olympic swimming pools, I was always into that. And then the main thing I've done my entire life is uh, I've been um, just over the course of since I was in my 20s, I've done different martial arts. So I did uh, like a early version of Kung Fu when I was living in Seattle in the International District. And, and I did Aikido for some years and studied Japanese sword and uh swinging a sword is actually a really good workout it's kind of like it's like lifting a dumbbell but you know using it um in very interesting isometric ways and uh yeah. i i think the combat and then i i still have a you know kind of a lighter uh i mean i used to train really hard and you know we we sparred and you know trained hard with with other uh martial artists and so yeah i I, I've done that my whole life, but now I kind of just do sort of a mellow workout that just keeps me flexible and keeps me in shape. And, and I do my push-ups. <laughs> that's, that's always a good one. The, pu- the push-up is kind of the great single exercise that everybody can do. And it's, um, it's a really good thing for just kind of keeping the upper body and the, and the cardio in good yeah. shape. No, absolutely. Yeah. So you grew up in, uh, I see I'm from Pacific Northwest too. I grew up in uh, a little, well, it used to be like a little town called Issaquah. Now it's blown up, but now you weren't, you were in Olympia or near Olympia. Well, I grew up just South of, uh, Olympia, um, in a town called Tumwater. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, but it was like actually kind of way out in the woods. Cause I grew up on a small farm. So it was, it was the sticks. Right. Uh, it's actually a really beautiful area. I was I was very happy as a kid. I loved growing up in the forest and and you know there were rivers and lakes nearby and and it was a really it was actually a really great place to to grow up. Yeah, and you could play your drums in the in the far in the uh uh the uh the ha- the hayloft of the hayloft. The barn. I actually yeah, in the barn. Had a, That's crazy. I had a little room set up uh, up there where I had my drums so I I could play in in the barn. Uh, cause my dad, uh, worked in the mining industry. Um, he, uh, he was an explosives expert. And so when he came home, he didn't want to be hearing me playing drums in the house. So, oh. so we built a, a little loft space in the barn and that's where I practiced. How, was 4th of July fun at your house? <laughs> oh my God. Let me tell you him and my <laughs> grandfather 
they would go to the uh, Nisqually Indian Reservation and buy all the illegal fireworks. And yeah, yeah. it was uh, <laughs> it was a good time. That sounds amazing. So was Skin Yard, was that your first like real band or was that your first band overall? Uh, well, the first band I was in was called Thin Men. And I joined that band in, I think, 1987. And it was kind of a punk rock band. It wasn't grungy. And, you know, we all had short kind of punk haircuts and we wore punk clothes and our songs were two and a half minutes long. And it was kind of fast, up-tempo punk pop music because that was actually a, a parallel form of music that was going on at the same time the grunge was getting going. You know, and so like there were bands like the Posies and... um and I'm trying to think of some other bands of that time, but they were they leaned more into the punk realm. And then there were the grunge bands that leaned probably a little more into the metal realm, which was also new at the time. Hmm. And um, or relatively new. I mean, I guess technically it started with Black Sabbath in the 70s, but but there were very different kinds of music going on in Seattle. And that's what made it exciting and interesting. There was also a lot of really cool experimental kind of avant-garde jazz and there was electronic uh electronic composers and and of course hip-hop and um so my first band was a punk band and i played with them for a couple of years and then we were doing a recording session that you know we got jack and dino to be our producer and jack was like maybe not so impressed with our punk band but he really liked the way i played drums and he invited me to work on some projects with him and that's how I joined Skin Yard, which is, they are considered, you know, one of the proto grunge bands that started that whole sound. Yeah, it's crazy. So you replaced Matt Cameron, who obviously went on to go play drums in Soundgarden. That's right. That's right. Matt's one of my oldest friends, too. Oh, so did he just uh, leave to go? For, was it for Soundgarden? Is that why he left? Well, Matt plays on the first Skin Yard record, which I think is 1985. And... Soundgarden, I think when they started, they, I think Chris Cornell was the drummer. And then they got a different guy to play drums and then Matt joined. So I think, you know, Matt joined, a, you know, a little bit after Soundgarden formed. But there were also a couple interim drummers in Skin Yard before I drummed. And so that's kind of how Seattle was. People were, you know, kind of changing seats and moving around and, you know, playing in different configurations until the bands kind of settled into the the lineup that everybody's familiar with. It's also, oh. what it, I mean, just kind of as a side note, that's also what made Seattle so cool back then is that we, um, we all knew each other and saw each other play in different musical okay. configurations until the bands were solidified. Yeah. So were you able to get uh, fans and an audience at that point when you're playing like, it's kind of really uh, like indie art rock. I mean, was there enough? Cause at, at the time at eighties, it was, I just think like heavy metal pop. I mean, I feel like it would be hard to find an audience for those kinds of things. Well, I, I think everybody would sort of agree that in the beginning when Seattle was, you know, I'm talking like the mid to late 1980s before mm -hmm. Nirvana, you know, kicked in the door. Yeah. It was kind of the same two or 300 people at all the shows. I mean, it was a very, <laughs> very small music oh. scene it wasn't you know the whole whole world yeah. wasn't aware of it it was just kind of those of us in seattle and in that kind of greater pacific northwest music scene so you'd see the same people at every show so it was like the small loyal following that just was into all that stuff yes yeah and and i, I you know people were aware that there was something going on it's not it's not that you know this was just the only game in town People knew that something was building and growing. There was no way to know how big it was going to become, but it, it was an exciting local scene that we were all participating in. So I saw, I think, the first or second Mud Honey show. I saw the first Tad show. I saw, I mean, my punk band got to open for the Screaming Trees in uh, 1988 at my, the old, college where i used to go there there was a show there that we got to open for the trees i saw the screaming trees open for sound garden i saw um well when i was in skin yard we 
open for Nirvana. So, right. they, you know, so all this stuff was going on before the rest of the world knew about this. Yeah. Tell the story. I heard you tell the story on um, your friend's podcast. This is so cool. My audience has to hear this. You go to the I-Beam with, with, uh, and Kurt Cobain is there. And this is when you guys see Dave Grohl play the drums in his punk band, The Scream. That's crazy. That's right. We So Skin Yard, we were playing a show in San Francisco at the I-Beam, which was this great kind of giant club on Haight Asbury. And uh, somehow Kurt or Chris from Nirvana had called Jack and Dino, the guitar player of Skin Yard, and said, hey, we're we're at the I-Beam checking out this drummer that, that we might hire to be in our band. Why don't you guys come down and we'll hang out? And Jack, of course, had produced the first Nirvana record, Bleach, and that record had been out for a while. So we went down to the I-Beam and Kurt and Chris were there and and um, and I, I had talked to Chris before. I, I never really knew Kurt, but I but I talked with Chris a couple of times. So I'm standing next to Chris, and we're watching Dave Grohl play with Scream, his punk band from Washington D.C. And there really weren't that many people there. It was kind of the club was pretty empty, but you know, Scream was this awesome punk band, and Dave was just destroying the drums. I mean, like really incredible drumming. And I leaned over to Chris and and uh I said I said man you better get this guy in your band before somebody else does and and he looked at me and he goes yep I think that's exactly what we're gonna do so how I always had wondered about that because you always hear stories about this where how these bands form and they got this guy from this other band and this guy from another band how do you convince somebody because when you're all I mean at this point Nirvana yeah they had bleach but they weren't like they are, are known now you know so it's like What's the saying? The the Scream band wasn't going to take off. Like, how do the how do they convince him to quit Scream and join Nirvana? Well, you know, at that time in American history, there were all of these really cool independent labels around the country. So in Washington D.C., you had the Discord label, and I think Scream was on Discord. So people knew of Scream. Um, also, the band Minor Threat was on that label, and yeah. I'm sure many others that I'm not remembering right now. But there were a lot of, of of very interesting record labels with really interesting bands all over the country. And I don't think anybody could have predicted which label or which, you know, sound, you know, quote unquote, was going to be, you know, the new thing. But I do think, you know, it ended up being Seattle. That just happened to be where, you know, the, the big explosion happened. But I... I will say that those musical elements were in all of the bands that came out of the, the Northwest. There was a punk element. There was a, a metal element. There was a hardcore element. And there there's a certain pop element because the reasons why those songs, like Nirvana songs and Alice in Chains songs and, and even Soundgarden songs, they might be really heavy, but they're catchy, you know? There, yeah. there are really, really good choruses and really great, you know, vocal melodies, and they stick in your mind, you know, for decades, and you remember those songs, and that's that's the best quality of pop music when you write a really great song, and it's so good that no matter what musical style it was, you remember it 20, 30, 40 years later. No, oh, absolutely. So he must have just made that to say he must have liked heard or like the music more or something but so then for you did now did you join screaming trees because was it partly because skin yard had kind of fallen apart at that point well skin yard um it was kind of winding down when i joined the screaming trees i mean when i joined the band we made two albums and and the band kind of had its highest uh success you know like our our 1991 album a thousand smiling knuckles was a was a pretty huge college radio album. And so we played all over North America and we did one pretty extensive European tour and we were being courted by some major labels because at that point Nirvana, you know, had the Nevermind album had come out and and uh, everybody was signing Seattle bands. So we had offers to sign with a major label, but Jack and Dino and I talked about it and Jack said, you know, look, I'm I'm not really made for touring, you know. He Jack was kind of older than other people. I mean, I was 22 at the time, and I think Jack was 32 or 33, and he just didn't really want to tour. He 
he really wanted to just be a producer and stay in recording studios. So it wasn't viable for Skin Yard to sign a major label deal and, and do that whole thing that you have to do. So literally on the flight home from London, from that first European tour that we did, we kind of had a little band meeting and Jack was like, look, I'm glad we got to tour Europe, but I really don't want to do this again. Let's just, you know, finish our last album, put it out, but, you know, let's have the band be done. And so that's what we did. The band amicably broke up on the plane, flying home from London. That last album, which was called Inside the Eye, came out in, I think, 1993, but the band had already broken up by that point. And that's right when when I joined the Screaming Trees was, um, I think it was November of 1991. We had just got back from Europe. And within two weeks of me getting home, I got the phone call from Van Connor to come audition for the Screaming Trees. Wow. So then talk about the writing for that Sweet Oblivion album, because I heard that at one point, half the songs didn't have lyrics or titles. And then your singer, Mark, he disappears for three days, goes on a binge, and he comes back with all the lyrics. I've never heard that story <laughs> because the way the, so when I joined the band, they were just starting to write those songs. Like the audition that I went to in uh, November of 1991, the songs were starting to be sketched out. So we worked okay. on, we worked on um, Sweet, Ab or I mean, uh, well, that's the album, but we worked on uh, Shadow of the Season, um, Dollar Bill, uh, there are a couple others. I can't remember all the names at this point, but um, and nearly lost you was written by Van, the bass player, and he kind of had those lyrics sketched out. Hmm. And so we we rehearsed those, you know, basic tracks very diligently. And Mark started coming and started to write lyrics as we were working on the songs. But but Lee, the guitar player, also had. Uh, kind of outlined some lyrical ideas and Mark would take some of Lee's ideas and enhance them and change them and maybe use some of the vocal melody but add his own melody and they would just sort of like continue to morph and so over the course of November, December and January of 1991 and early 1992 we just kind of worked on those songs and we did them at my loft space in the international district because they saw where I practiced and then it was quite a bit nicer than the rehearsal room that the Screaming Trees had been using, which was in a steel foundry. And it was a cool space because the guy that owned the steel foundry loved rock and roll. And so he made one of his vacant buildings, he partitioned it into a bunch of rehearsal studios. And that's where the trees had been rehearsing. But you can imagine it was kind of a dingy place to practice. So they saw my, my loft space and everybody moved their gear over to my place. And we wrote Sweet Oblivion in my loft. Um, and and yes, you know, Mark certainly added his own lyrics and, and it was an ongoing process, but it, it's not accurate to say that there weren't lyrics already there and that it was all done in three days. It was about three months of us just, sh you know, shedding the tunes and diligently working out every detail which is why when we recorded it, it was it was fully realized when we went into the studio. So then like for your drum parts, cause that you're, you know, not to like kiss up a little bit, but like you really are one of those drummers where you're the drums stand out in that band. Like, even if you listen to nearly lost, you're like the, you know, it's like the, it's like part of the song. Do you just play that? Like that's your vision for the drums or, or somebody saying, Hey, why don't you do this on the drums? How does that work? Well, as a drummer, I've always been influenced by, very specifically um, British drummers from the from the British invasion of the 60s and 70s and drummers from from like the Motown and Stax Records era of American soul music. And when you listen to any of those drummers, they all have a distinct style and they play these really cool parts that become almost like they're not just rhythmic undercurrents. They are specifically these pop hooky, catchy parts. So like Ringo Starr is one of my favorite drummers because he wrote drumming parts that stick in your mind as like, that's not just the rhythm for the song. It's part of the song and it's catchy like a like a hook or a riff. Almost. Yeah. Like think about his drum drum track for Come Together. It's a very specific pattern that he plays and it's 
you know, your mind remembers that. Or the way John Bonham would play a groove, you know, it would be a groove, but it would be so unique and specific that you will never forget that groove. And it's part of the song. (laughs) Exactly. And I know that he was really influenced by the drummers of Motown and and Stax, you know, in that that Memphis, uh, you know, Detroit soul uh, explosion. And so you can hear that groovy way of playing in his playing. But but I also love the way Al Jackson Jr. played and Clyde Stubblefield and, you know, James Brown's drummers. And and so when I write a drum track, I think about it as like this is part of the song. It, it should have catchy, memorable moments that also serve the spirit of the song, you know. And with the Screaming Trees, that was the thing. Like we all wrote songs and, you know, over the course of a long period of time, we would synthesize, you know, a hundred songs that we had written into the best 15 songs. And then that's what we would record for an album. So by the time we got to that point, everything had gone through, uh, you know, sort of like a strainer and everything good got through and anything, you know, that wasn't, didn't quite meet the the lit, litmus test, you know, didn't get through. Yeah, so you co-wrote yeah. some of the songs on on that album. For people who don't know, I mean, obviously you're a phenomenal drummer, but you do so much more. You play all these other instruments. How do you typically write a song? Um, you, I'm assuming you don't write the songs on the drums. You probably use guitar or keyboard. Or well, sometimes I've written songs on the drums because a rhythmic idea can spawn a song idea. So you'll be playing the drums, and then you'll kind of sing out a uh, a little bit of a of a um, of a melody. Uh, or I also am an upright bass player. So I started on upright bass when I was in high school. And then I also play electric bass and I'm a pretty good keyboard player. Um, I can play guitar a little bit, but I'm, I'm mostly focused on keyboards and, uh, and bass. So I've written a lot of music that way. And so I would write songs and then we'd be working on like, let's say a song that Gary Lee had written and mark maybe had a had a melodic lyrical idea and then i would be like okay this is cool but you know we need an intro and we need you know a bridge and you know we need to um you know kind of shape this into something a little more sophisticated and i i sort of attribute that to the fact that i went to music school to study jazz and classical music and so i kind of thought of songs in an arranging kind of way so I would I would think of, you know, intros and outros and and interesting left turns in the bridge that would make the song a little more interesting than just a verse and a chorus. So that's kind of that was my influence on the Screaming Trees was was bringing in those additional parts that sort of fleshed the song out into something a little more sophisticated than the way that it might have started. That's awesome. So I'm assuming you go into a lot more detail in this upcoming book, which uh, I haven't got a chance to read. I just read your last book, uh, Still Point. That was phenomenal. People should check that out. But this one is called The Greatest Band That Whatever Wasn't. And this is about <laughs> right. Screaming Trees, right? Yeah, it's yeah, The Greatest Band That Ever Wasn't. Because, I mean, it's, it's you know, people who follow the band know the history. You know, we could also be very self-destructive. And, and um, you know, we all had, you know, the classic battle with drugs and alcohol. Um, but I think it was... What was great about the band was our, we were really four really eccentric, very talented live wires. So when the four of us were in a room and writing songs, it was incredibly powerful. And on stage, we could do these incredible shows, but sometimes that kind of energy can also reverse on itself and you can, you can have, you know, more destructive elements come in. So on any given night, we could be like this incredible live band, but then we could also have a really terrible show too. You know, we we weren't consistent. And the the truth of the matter when you're when you're talking about having a long term career in music is you got to be consistent. You know, you have to consistently write songs and consistently make great records, and consistently tour and play good shows that really, you know, they stay with people as 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 good memories. And uh, that that's something that we were sort of able to do. But, you know, it, it took us a long time to make a record. We weren't fast at it. Uh, we couldn't keep that fast pace up and tour and make records all the time. It was just too much for us. I think it just 
the band had a shelf life and we maxed it to, you know, as long as we could. And then when the band finally did break up, everybody was sober. Everybody was on good terms and we knew we were going to break up and we knew when our final show was and that was it. Yeah, that's crazy, though, that uh, I mean, just all the ups and downs. So explain, because I know like one of the shows you said was bad when it was when you opened for the Black Crows in Germany. So like, oh, for yeah. example, like what? What was how did the bat what t- constitutes a bad show at that point? Was this because of the drugs and out, like people were too fucked up, or what's the issue there? Well, that was the last tour that we did of Europe, and Mark was in really bad shape. Um, I was actually finally sober myself. Um, you know, I had I had a long battle with alcoholism because it was it was in my family for generations, and you know, it was just inevitable that it would come up in me, but. I had gotten sober and the other guys in the band, you know, Lee was always sober. I mean, he never drank or did drugs or did anything. Uh, But Mark was in pretty bad shape and that tour was getting pretty ragged near the end. And uh, we, we were opening for the black crows uh, playing. It was a festival on television and uh, we had to, well, Mark left the stage early And we had to stop the show early because we couldn't play without him. And we didn't realize it was being broadcast live on television. So there was kind of this scene where we went back to our dressing room and the German TV uh, producers were banging on the dressing room. Like, you have to get back out on stage. We're live on television. And we just barricaded the door. And we're like, nope, we're not going back out on stage. And that's the end of the show. So wow. that, that that actually wasn't even that horrible of an experience. It was just, you know, this is the kind of stuff that happens when you're, you know, you agree to do television shows or, or live taped performances, you know, because, uh, you know, you build a production uh, schedule around a rock band that might be a little unstable. <laughs> it's just not not really the smartest way to do it. Right. Well, and then I'm sure you talk about this in the book uh, in depth, but uh, we could talk a little bit about the tour with Allison Chains. And I think and Grunt Truck was on there, too. Right. Yeah. And and Grunt Truck was the band that the singer from Skin Yard started after uh, we a- after Skin Yard had broken up. And Grunt Truck was a great band. They, I love them. Yeah. Yeah. And Ben had that same thing. He had that really good sense of pop songwriting so he could write a catchy really really good melody with good lyrics and it was but it was also a heavy cool rock song so i, I yeah, the actually, song tribe is that's what i love that song especially that was a great song yeah and they um i can't remember because that tour was kind of a blur and you know i can't even remember how long it went but they joined that alice and change tour after we had already been doing it for a while they added them as as the opener. So it would be Grunt Truck, then Screaming Trees, then Alice in Chains. Yeah, I mean, there was the thing, I'm sure you write about this in the book with, where Mark almost loses his arm to, to heroin, a blood infection, and then, then yeah. Link gets the same. Yeah. And then yeah. there's, there's also a video that I saw online of uh, Lane Staley jumping into the audience to beat up a fan who was being a dickhead, everybody. And then Lane gets arrested. It's like, it's crazy, like all I, these stories. I kind of vaguely remember that. I, I mean, I do remember when Lane got on stage to play with the Screaming Trees. He, um, yeah, he was subbing for Mark, and he sang "Nearly Lost You," and I think that's actually the only song he sang. It sounded phenomenal. I only heard like twenty seconds of it, but he, he, it doesn't yeah. like that voice. It doesn't, it doesn't miss a beat. Yeah, Lane's voice was incredible. I mean, he, he was one of the. I think he might be the greatest singer I've ever worked with because he had that incredible voice. But when we did the Mad Season album, he would come into the studio with a fully realized vocal part, like with the lyrics and the melody and the harmonies. And so he would sing it in real time, of course, because we're recording on tape. And there's no auto tune back then. I mean, in 1994, you actually had to be a singer. You actually had to sing in tune and sing like a human being no computer assisted technology and he would sing this beautiful lead vocal and then he would stack his backup you know his backing vocals in exactly the places where he wanted to do it and it would just be this incredible vocal performance that he 
heard in his mind and then just went out into the studio and just laid it down. I've never yeah. seen anybody since then be able to do that. It was really, really remarkable. Amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Mad Season stuff is so underrated. Like the song, I don't know anything. I mean, that's got to be one of my favorite all-time riffs. I love that song. The River of Deceit is so beautiful. Was there ever uh, plans for a second Mad Season album or was there any demos recorded or anything? Oh, yeah. We we started um, working on a second album in uh, 96. And uh, so, you know, a couple of years after the first album. And we recorded, I think, 17 or 18 basic song ideas. Um, and, you know, the, the first record did extremely well. I mean, uh, I don't know what the current sales figures are, but I mean, I, it's pretty close to double platinum at this point. Um, and, and we wanted to do more touring, but we couldn't because everybody's, you know, the day job band. So Alice in Chains, Screaming Trees, Pearl Jam, you know, we all had very busy touring schedules. So we were only able to play a handful of shows in Seattle. And then we were back in our regular bands. So in 96, we started working on, on more basic tracks. Um, but we just weren't able to finish them. You know, Lane's health was deter deteriorating pretty badly. And so we never finished it. However, when we did the box set, Mark Lanigan finished three of those songs. And those were the those three songs that are in the box set are the only songs that we were able to finish from that second album. Oh, OK, so you couldn't finish some of the other ones because I don't know. Like, did you hear that new Beatles song where they went back and they finished the song with uh, Jeff Lynn? So it's pretty amazing. Right, but they also had John Lennon's original vocals from the demo, and they were able to extract his vocals from the demo, and then, then right. the rest of the band could play to that. But we didn't even have any demo vocals; like there, there's just oh. no vocals. Okay, it was just, we were just working on the music for Lane and Mark to, you know, to sing vocals to, and so. But Mark really liked those three songs. One of them was written by Peter Buck of REM because Peter. Uh, jammed with us when we were doing that second album so and aren't you in a band with him too or something rich robinson of black crows yeah i, I mean i've been in in bands with peter we were just counting up how many albums we played on peter and i have played on 35 albums together <laughs> just as, wow. back, as backing musicians so we you know we would back up a singer songwriter uh but of course you know i played in rem on a couple albums and then Peter and I had the two Atara project with which was an instrumental band that sometimes would back up singer songwriters and then Peter and Rich Robinson of the Black Crows and myself and Joseph Arthur made an album uh, about two years ago but we haven't found time to release it and promote it yet because the Black Crows are still on tour and Peter's got a bunch of projects and and so at some point that record will eventually come out and you know it's a really beautiful record too. I was really going to say, I was looking, I heard you guys talking about it and I was trying to find it. I'm like, I can't find it. What is the band called? Does it have a name? Uh, we called it the silver lights because okay. we're all silver haired now too. Okay. <laughs> um, and yeah, it'll eventually come out. Uh, we talked about it on Joe's podcast, but, yeah. uh, and I think a couple of magazines picked up on it and wrote some articles, but it just hasn't come out, you know, and there's, there is this thing now, you know, it's, if you're going to release a record, you really have to like time the release and go out and promote it. Otherwise it just kind of people forget about it right away. Right. Well, back to screaming trees. Um, I wanted to ask about that. So there was such a, such a long uh, break between uh, sweet oblivion and then the next record, the fall up dust. Why was it such a long uh, hiatus? Is it just because, like you said, it just took a long time to write songs and things? Well, we did. Okay, so we got back from the Sweet Oblivion World Tour, and it was two and a half years. I mean, it's a long time to be on the road. Wow. Um, most tours, you know, are done in nine months. A, a really big band, like, you know, you know, the Rolling Stones or U2 might tour for 18 months. But we did two and a half years on the road. And by the time we got back, we were so tired and we didn't really have very much time to write songs because we were just touring all the time. And we, we did start to make a record in 1994 and um, it's actually a pretty good record. Um, it was never titled and it was never released, but we wrote about 15 songs and, uh, but we just felt like 
it wasn't as good as Sweet Oblivion and we didn't want to release something right after that record that wasn't of the same caliber. So we took more time to write songs and we took some of the best songs from that session and, and included them in what became the Dust album. But so, you know, two and a half years of that four year period was touring and then another six months recording an album. And then finally, you know, we finished the Dust album. So it was it's it's hard to explain it in words, except that, you know, time can go by so fast when you're on the road. It just becomes a blur. And next thing you know, two years have gone by and it's like, wow, we have to make another record. But it takes a year to write songs and record and make a great record. So that's why it took four years. Yeah. So then you do um, in 96, right after, I think it was either must have been right before, right after Dust was released, uh, you did Lollapalooza. Do you yes. have any memories of doing that? That must have been a lot of fun because it's like so many other great bands on the venue. It was. And and I liked a lot of those bands. I mean, the Ramones and Soundgarden and even Devo did some special appearances on that. And it, and I loved Devo and, and loved uh, all of those bands. But that was when Lollapalooza was a touring, you know, it was a, uh, I think it was 30 shows or you know, 35 shows. I mean, quite a lot of shows. And so by the end of that, you know, that's a pretty exhausting tour. And so by the end of it, like the impact of, of those bands, you know, after you've heard them night after night after night, you know, wow. it just, it, it, it starts to not be as interesting as when you first started. So you but, can't, so you actually watch it, stay and watch them or you don't like go backstage and hide out when they're playing. Well, we were all backstage together all the time, but I would, you know, I'd go on the side of the stage and I'd watch the Ramones and I'd watch Soundgarden and, um, and, and I loved when Devo played. And there were a couple of shows where we had like Waylon Jennings, like the great outlaw country singer. Nice. He, he was incredible. Waylon Jennings, Steve Earle did some shows. Um, those shows were more interesting to yeah. me as a musician, but, but I mean, when you do a, a tour that's that big with so many big bands, you know, after a while, it just, it does, it, it kind of becomes routine. And I, and I don't mean that in a way like, like these aren't killer, amazing bands, but right. you just see it night after night after night. And it, it sort of just becomes routine. Right. Were you supposed to tour with Oasis too? What, what happened with that? We did play about, it was supposed to be a two week tour and we, and we did, uh, about a week of it because the Oasis brothers started fighting and they, they actually canceled the rest of the tour also because I don't think they, they didn't go over across this. Hello. Shit. Can you, can you still hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I lost it for a second. Something happened where it timed out, but okay. We're back. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, so the Oasis thing. Yeah. So we were supposed to do about two weeks of shows opening for them. The opening band was called Manic Street Preachers, which is a yeah, really remember that. great band still going from uh, Wales. Screaming Trees are in the middle. And then uh, um, Oasis was headlining. The Manic Street Preachers went across really well because they're just a great rock band. We went across really well. But Oasis, you know, they're a little bit of that shoegazing kind of, you know, looking down, standing there, not really rocking out. And American audiences could feel that like they were they were not as engaged, I think. And their shows were not going over very well. And I think after about a week of shows, they just canceled the rest and went back to England. So Oasis canceled the, the remaining parts of that tour. Wow. Interesting. Um, and then to explain to my audience what bumper shoot is. Cause I think you guys played bumper shoot too. And that was such a fun thing in Seattle. If you grew up in Seattle, you knew what it was. It used to, and I think it used to be free and now it's like super corporate. Like I don't, you probably have to pay a thousand dollars for a good ticket or something, but you guys played <laughs> in 98. It was probably really yeah. fun back then. Okay. Bumper shoot is one of the first. And I think if I remember reading this correctly, at one point, it was the biggest music festival in the United States. It was started locally in Seattle, and it would attract huge musical stars from all over the world would play this festival. I, I, you know, I mean, like, you know, the biggest bands in the world would play at this festival. 
And uh, and it was, it was very local and homegrown and the Screaming Trees played it, I think you're right, I think it was 1998. Um, and, and in fact, uh, we played with Buck Owens, the great uh, country artist from uh, Bakersfield. And um, and I think actually, I think he opened for us. But then it kind of, you know, like all things, you know, it kind of fell into disrepair and it was owned by a big corporation at some point and the corporation ran it into the ground. But now it just came back this last summer for the first time in many years and it's locally owned again and they're building it back up. So oh, ho hopefully it'll, it'll just continue to come back like that. That's awesome. And then, um, yeah, so you, besides music, you do so many other things, but one of the things you do is photography, right? Well, no, my wife is a professional photographer. She's an amazing photographer, and she just published her um, first photography book. It's called uh, Numa, uh, P-N-E-U-M-A, you know, which means breath and spirit. And it's photographs that she did around the world while we were traveling, filming this music series that I'm developing. And uh, she she took all these beautiful still photos and put them into a book. Um, so, yeah, photography is her talent. It's definitely not my talent. Oh, really? I, well, you know, I snap photos with my iPhone from time to time, and it's just kind of to capture the moment. But it's not the kind of stuff that I would ever like print or oh. put. Look, but yeah. Okay, so like, but did you have pictures from back in the day of the of the Seattle bands, or was that your wife too? Well, no, some of those photos are from like a a really bad Kodak camera that I had. Well, not it wasn't a bad camera; it was just like a point and shoot, you know, film camera. So I do have some photos from Skin Yard and early Screaming Trees, and uh, even you know my first punk rock band. I've got some photos of that. They're not, you know, great photos, but I guess they're they're sort of like snapshots of time. And I've been using those in my live show that I'm doing when I when I show films. Sometimes I just have, you know, like a few of these photographs on the screen, you know, because a photograph is powerful, you know, just looking at an image that's 30 or 35 years old of like what we look like when we were 20, 21 years old playing in our first rock bands, you know, it's it's effective. Um but my wife is the, she's the the great photographer for sure. Like that's her talent. Yeah. So, and did your wife, I thought, I thought I heard you say your wife did a, um, cause I've done one of those like 10 day meditation uh -huh. things where you don't talk, but like your wife did it for yeah. three and a half years. That's how did she do that? Was that when she was still married to you or dating you? It was right before we got married. She did a three and a half, three and a half year silent retreat in the Arizona desert, like completely isolated three and a half years meditating looking inward at the human spirit and as a result she's probably the wisest human being that i personally know wow that's yeah that's because i i was going crazy after 10 days i mean really on the first day i was going crazy <laughs> by 10 days i was like i gotta get out of here and i they told me like the the teacher or whatever i was trying to learn the technique and he's like you have monkey mind you know it's like i just yeah. couldn't do it. So that's amazing that she was able to, I guess if you have, if you took that much time, you probably figure it out and uh, yeah, get real introspective. And are you into that stuff as well? The meditation and things? Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's, that's kind of why we met is that I've been a Zen med meditator since the uh, mid 1990s. So about 30 years I've been doing Zen and it's a different, like my wife studied the Tibetan uh, meditation style and I studied the Japanese style, but you know, there's a lot of, I mean, these are universal truths, so they're 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 understandable by anybody that learns how to meditate. So, I mean, I've I've done several days of silent meditation. I've never done three and a half years. Um, but yeah, I mean, like we I think anybody that studies the meditative practices, um, you all understand the same things and. But for what, whatever it's worth, I totally have the monkey mind as well. I mean, that's a very common phrase. It's very hard to learn how to control the chattering of the mind. But the more that you do learn how to meditate and control your mind, that chatter just starts to, it, it just gets quieter and quieter. And you're no longer ruled by those, those thoughts or those impulses. They just, you just sort of, you know, make them fade away. That's amazing. Yeah. And congratulations. Cause, and I think this is all connected. You have like, I think 22 or maybe now it's more 22 or three, 23, 24 years of sobriety. 
Yeah, about 24 years now. 24, okay. Yeah, 24. Yeah, uh, yeah. Talk about that and how that's, because I think that is something that, you know, maybe it's not talked enough about in our society and, and how, I mean, it's just, you hate to see these people like Kurt and Lane and Chris Cornell. Uh, you know, it's like, I feel like there's, they're struggling with those demons. And if they had learned maybe some techniques like this, do you think the meditation could help replace the drugs? Well, I think it has helped a lot of people. I mean, looking back on it historically, at the time, I thought it was just our generation. I thought, wow, Generation X really has a problem with addiction. You know, there was there were just drugs everywhere. And of course, alcoholism is the most common addiction in the United States because it's socially acceptable to be an alcoholic. It's it's allowed, even though it's so mentally and physically destructive to people. Um, and yeah, I, I was not a, a drug user, but I was a terrible alcoholic. And a lot of it is genetic. And the more we learn about genetics and people's propensity for those things, you know, the more we can help them and, and you know, let them know, like, OK, you got to watch out for this. Um, but I think, you know, there's just as many drugs now as there ever were, maybe more. You know, so many people have had problems with with drug addiction. And and all I can say is my own personal path was that because I saw and and had to actually bury my friends and i saw how destructive drug addiction and and addiction of any kind but specifically drugs and alcohol i realized that that was not the way i was going to go and i didn't want it to ruin my path as a as an artistic creative person and so i've worked on myself to get sober and stay sober and learn how to uh, remove the things that would trigger those impulses. And so um, I think that those tools work no matter what generation you are, because they're kind of universal. And the more we learn about addiction and, and, and genetic programming, the more we can, you know, kind of stave that off. But at the end of the day, the individual person has to decide that they want sobriety. You have to actually make the decision that you don't want to be an alcoholic or an addict, and you just simply decide that, and then you work towards, you know, using all of the tools at your disposal, uh, at your disposal to stay that way. Right. And that seems to be the issue um, right now. I mean, and I think you talk about this in the, in the still point in the book about the homelessness and the drugs. And I know yeah. that there's resources out there. I feel like a lot of people uh, they're not trying like, yeah, it's like a decision that they're, they don't want to get help. They they yes. want to be on drugs. They want to be homeless. And it's just it's really sad because there's just so much wasted potential is what I what I see. Yeah, the resources are there. That's for sure. There are a lot of outreach programs to help people with those problems. Um, but it still comes down to the individual deciding, like, I do not want to live like this anymore. I want to change. And once you really make that decision and you really mean it, then you you can change. But it does yeah. come down. The individual has to decide that. Yeah, no, I feel like I feel like that's a with a lot of things though. I, I mean, somebody's asked me yesterday, like, how did you grow your, you know, YouTube channel and your podcast stuff? And I was like, I just I made a decision I was gonna do this. Like this is what I want to do. And then it's like when you make a decision or you set a goal, then it's like somehow you kind of your body and your mind kind of just start weaving into the direction of, of making it happen. That's, that's exactly right. You, you just make, I mean, this is, you can say this about not just about becoming sober, but you just decide like, I am going to be this person and I'm going to become an architect or a doctor or a lawyer or a, a scientist or a biologist an environmentalist. You, you decide that you want to be someone that can make the world better and you diligently follow that path. And it's not easy. You know, it's not designed to be easy. If, you, if you're going to do great work in the world as, as someone that's an advocate for human beings and the environment and making the world safer and cleaner and more equal for everyone, if you're going to work towards that, it's going to be hard. And, but you have to be willing to go through that transformation. And the transformation process is what makes you the capable person to do that thing, whatever it is you've decided to do. Yeah. And do you, do you find that it's, it's not difficult to be creative being sober? Like how, how do you find your creativity um, in sobriety? Is it, do you find it through the meditation or other, or being with nature? I know you talked about like that in your book as well. 
Well, I, I can say absolutely for sure that I'm so much more creative in these nearly 25 years that I've been sober than I ever was before that. I mean, when I look me like if I literally look at the timeline, I see how many records I made, you know, in my 20s up until the point when I when I got sober, uh, which was which was right. I mean, I was starting to get sober at the end of the Screaming Trees and then like complete sobriety by the year 2000. But my creative output from from that point up till now is like 10 times what I did in the handful of years before that. I mean, it's I, and, I, and I get it from a lot of different things. Yes, going out into the forest and hiking in, in the woods or, or, or climbing a mountain or or doing a, a sailing adventure like I did this summer. Um, hugely creative and lots of ideas come. but. But, you know, the way an artist really works, and, and I talk about this in the Screaming Trees book, um, there's this famous saying uh, by the artist Chuck Close, and he says, inspiration is for amateurs. And what he's saying is like, you don't sit around and wait for the lightning bolt to strike you with creativity. You go to the studio every day and you work on a song or you work on a painting or you sit there in front of the typewriter or computer and you I say typewriter because I used to write on a typewriter and you write the story you just sit there and do it and sometimes those days aren't as creative and you might struggle and like feel like you didn't get anything done but you did because you showed up and you worked on something and the next time you show up you're going to have a breakthrough and you're going to get the song or the story or the painting so to truly be creative as an artist, you you sit there or stand there and, and you work every day on that art. You don't sit around waiting to be inspired. You make the inspiration come from the praxis of doing the art itself. Interesting. So it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier, why the Screaming Trees didn't make it bigger. Is it was the, They didn't have the cons consistency. So that's a big part of it is the habits and the consistency. Yes, the consistency. You have to, yeah, especially with the rock band. I mean, like, I this is something I can speak from a pretty expert opinion because I've been in a lot of bands and some of them were, you know, Mad Season was very successful and the Screaming Trees were successful in a certain kind of way because even though the band, you know, didn't last as long as other bands, we did write some really great songs, but it came from when those four or five guys show up at the studio and you practice and you rehearse and you refine and you perfect the song. And so all of the bands I've been in have had moments where they were able to do that. And, and that is when you, that, that's when you do write a classic album. You just sit there and work at it really, really hard. That's, that's how you do that. But if you're not consistent in that over the course of years and decades, eventually the band is going to break up because it, it's just the nature of things. You know, you can pull things together for a little while, but if you don't consistently work at that, it will dissipate. And that's what causes a band to break up. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Now, are, and are you still in a, is walking paper still active? Or? They're still active. Although, you know, I started that band with uh, Jeff Angel and Duff McKagan and, um, and it was a great band. I mean, I, love the first couple albums we did uh duff and i you know duff is the bass player for guns and roses and, oh yeah i'm a huge guns and roses fan. i love duff yeah, i'm trying to get him yeah, on my show forever duff is one of my favorite human beings he's just a one also you know very very long time sober incredibly creative and wonderful human being i love duff and we've been friends since the i mean i've met him in the late 1990s when he was living in Los Angeles and Mark Lanigan was actually living with him. And, and we were all sober at that time huh. and, um, and, and have remained so. But uh, Duff and I, tried, we tried to form a band in like 1997 with Send Dog from Cypress Hill. Like he and I, what? And, yeah, we wrote all these really cool songs that were kind of had this like kind of rock and backbeat with send dog rapping over the top of it it was actually very cool just drums bass and and vocals and we made a demo but we i don't know we just didn't like we didn't finish it we didn't try to get a record deal it was just this kind of cool thing that we tried out duff has the tape somewhere and um and then it was 
almost 15 years later, Duff and I decided to, to form a band again. And he and I again were the rhythm section. And let me tell you, that is a good rhythm section. Me on drums and Duff on bass. I love it. It swings. It's heavy and it swings and it's really cool. Um, and we made a couple albums, uh, but we we had problems with our record label. Like it was it was kind of made made a couple of bad business decisions with the record label we were on, and the record label went out of business, and the records went out of print for a while. And Duff got the offer to do the Guns N' Roses reunion. And he was like, bro, I got to do this. And I was like, <laughs> hell, hell yes, you do. You got to do it right now. And so we both left the band at the same time. And Jeff has kept it going. Um, we gave him the rights to the name and everything. But I'm I'm not sure exactly what he's doing with it right now. So, oh, OK, well, so you're you've got this book coming out and then you're doing like a it's a speaking tour. Is that what it is? Yeah, I'm uh I'm well it's it's quite a bit more than speaking. I basically so I'm developing a music series and we're about to release the first few episodes and it's called uh Singing Earth, which is also the name of my first book. And so it's Singing Earth, you know, hosted by Barrett Martin and we go around the world and we interview musicians and do recording sessions with them. Sometimes it's in a recording studio, but I we filmed an episode last summer in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest and we recorded these shamans that sing in the rainforest. And so it's got shots of us in Brazil and Peru and Seattle and the Mississippi Delta and Alaska up in the Arctic. And this is just the first season and we're finishing editing the, the episodes and they're about to launch on our Vivo channel. So it'll be on Vivo, which you can watch on, you know, it's a streaming channel, so you can get it on your Roku device or you can watch it on YouTube uh, because they have a partnership with YouTube. And that's uh, amazing. And so wow. I'm showing clips of, of us in all these different locations. I'm showing short film clips. I'm telling stories about these different places. And I'm also playing a bunch of musical instruments on stage oh. while, the, while the films are playing Okay, you know, as, as part of this kind of providing live music for the soundtrack. So okay. it's um it's about a two hour multimedia show and we've just done three shows like the tour has just begun. I'm in Portland right now and I'm on my way to Eugene tonight and uh, California tomorrow. Awesome. Would you be adding dates? Because I didn't see, I'm in Arizona now and uh, I didn't see Arizona on the list. Unfortunately, there is not an Arizona date. I mean, well, I love Arizona and we'll come back and, and play there. Um, but right now we've got about uh, 26 shows around the United States. So it goes across, you know, we go through New Mexico, Texas, Florida, up the East Coast, through the Great Lakes. And I think the last show is in Denver on December 10th. So but all the show dates are published on my website and and um, bands in town. You know, it's all out there in the universe for people to yeah. find a show near them. But it's it's been going really good. People seem to really like the combination of the storytelling, the films and the uh, and all the music and, and just learning about music around the world is even if you're not a musician, it's fascinating. You know, what are people doing in the Peruvian rainforest? What are they doing? in the studios of Rio de Janeiro and what are they doing in the Alaskan Arctic or down in the Delta? It's, it's exciting. No, absolutely. It's uh, it sounds amazing. Um, I'll have to check out the book when it comes out. What, what is it? Do we have a release date on the book? It's today. Oh, it's, it's okay. literally today. It is, a, it is available worldwide. I mean, most people buy books on Amazon or yeah. uh, Barnes and Noble, but you can also order it through your local bookshop or you can buy it off my website, you know, barrettmartin.com. It's, you can. Is this one going to be on Audible too? Because that's how I listened to Still Point. And it was really cool because you had the music in yes. the Audible book. I was like, this is so cool that, the way you did that. Is that how you have the same way for the Screaming Trees book? I did do, I did make an audible book for, for this new Screaming Trees book with me narrating it, but I didn't put music because it's really complicated to get the rights to all of those Screaming Trees songs. Um, to, I couldn't, I could, it was just, it was going to take longer than writing the book. Gotcha. <laughs> so, yeah. So the audible is just me telling the story. There's okay. no music in there, but um, yeah. Oh, all, you can get, you can listen to the music on Spotify and all that stuff. So yeah. Yeah. The music's all, yeah. I mean, the Very music's, cool. it's free. It, 
the funny thing is, is yeah, the music's free, but you can't, <laughs> if you want to do it on an audible, you got to get all these rights. And so that's so silly. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you so much for doing this. And yeah, people should uh, check out that uh, I'll put the sh- uh, website in the show notes so they can check for tour dates of the books out now. And you also have so much other music and, uh, and books out available. Anything else you want to promote? Oh, just if, if anybody wants to check out my website, I, 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 I'm not like super quick on updating things because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an older person, so I'm not super savvy with social media, but I do have, you know, I've got a Instagram page and I have a Facebook page and my website, BarrettMartin.com. You can buy my book. I'm actually, I have a whole bunch of signed books, so you can buy signed copies of my books through my website, but you can buy all my books on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or you can be really cool and order them through your local bookstore and support small businesses. I love it. That's great. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I'll let you get to the next one. Thanks, Chuck. It was a pleasure speaking. All right. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye, Barrett. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the full podcast episode. Please help support our guests by following them on social media and purchasing their products, whether it be a book, album, film, or other thing. And if you have a few extra dollars, please consider donating it to their favorite charity. If you want to support the show, you can like, share, and comment on this episode on social media and YouTube. And if you want to go the extra mile, you can give us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. Finally, make sure you're subscribed to the show on YouTube for the video versions and other exclusive content. We appreciate your support. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.